Ahoy there folks, I'm Captain Benzie and welcome back to another video for EVE Online. Last week I put out a video talking about the naming conventions of the Minmata Republic. Some of you folks seem to really enjoy that, so this week we're going to go through the Kaldari State's names. What do they all mean, where do those names come from, and how do you actually pronounce them? Fortunately, the Kaldari state names are actually pretty self-explanatory for the most part. I don't think there are any here that are ridiculously hard to pronounce or understand where they come from, but still, some of you found it interesting, so let's jump right in. As usual, if you do enjoy this video or find anything interesting, let me know. Drop a comment of which your favorite Kaldari ship is. Let me know that you've enjoyed the video by hitting like on it and consider subscribing to the channel for more content like this. If you're fairly new to EVE Online or just if you've not used a referral code before, click my referral link in the description to earn yourself 1 million free skill points and give me a small kickback. And of course, you can come join the Catskull Community Discord link down there as well. Brilliant way to talk to a bunch of like-minded EVE Online players who are really enjoying the game, get some tips and tricks, and even join the Catskull Cartel in-game if that's something you'd like to do. Anyway, with that said and done, let's open up the ship tree and talk about the different Kaldari state ship names, where they come from, and what they mean. So if we start off with the Corvette, the Corvette for the Kaldari state is very standard named. A lot of Kaldari state ship names are based on modern day birds. So a lot of these names you'll find are birds from around the world. There are some that are other more mythological animals, and this does give a little bit of crossover with the Minmata Republic. So first of all then, for the Corvette, we have the Ibis. An Ibis is a type of small-ish, medium, I guess, bird. We used to get these a lot in Zimbabwe. They are actually a very sort of Egyptian-looking bird. The Egyptian Ibis is the one that we used to get on the Zambezi a lot. It's that bird that, if you remember the Egyptian god Thoth, uh, the god of wisdom, that is the particular bird we're talking about. They're small, water-based birds for the most part. Um, pretty cool, and it's just a very standard name for them. Going into the Tech 1 frigates, most of these are, again, birds. We have the, of course, Kestrel. Kestrel being a bird of prey, um, renowned for its ability to hover. We see these quite a lot in the UK, especially near motorways and main roads. They like to hover on the roads, wait for the cars to go past, and then swoop down and catch roadkill, for example, or dive into the grass nearby. Interesting enough, just for a bit of actual lore and backstory for the Kestrel as well, originally the Kestrel in the Kaldari state terms was a water transport that during the Kaldari Galente War was repurposed originally as a troop lander and then eventually as a combat vessel, which is why it has those three long bars in the center. Those are actually not cockpits or anything like that. The capsule goes into the side of the Kestrel, but it's actually originally a water transport that became a troop transport and and then eventually became a combat vessel. The Merlin. Again, a Merlin is a type of bird, surprisingly enough. It is a piscivorous bird, if I think correctly, if I'm being correct on that one. I may be wrong on this. It's one of the ones I'm a little less unclear of. So actually, let me just grab my notes here and we'll have a look at what a Merlin actually is. Obviously, Merlin is also the mythological figure in King Arthur. It is the wizard. Um, so there is that as well that does kind of go in with the mythological. But yeah, there we are, Merlin. It's a small species of falcon from the northern hemisphere with numerous subspecies throughout North America and Eurasia. It's a hawk-style creature, which makes a lot of sense, as we'll see later on. We then have the heron. Now, a heron is obviously a fairly large water bird. They're waders. They're the ones with the long legs and the very long necks that you often see walking in marshes and the sides of rivers where they will walk through the water and then dip their long neck in to grab passing fish. This works quite nicely for the explorer because a heron naturally is a bird that explores the water around it looking for its meal. Not particularly an aggressive bird by any stretch, hence it's not really a combat vessel, the heron, it's much more your exploratory vessel, but I feel that works really quite nicely with the type of bird that the heron is. Coming up to the second row, we have the Bantam. This to me strikes a very unusual name. A Bantam is essentially a type of chicken. Now I know that that can come across in Western culture as quite like ridiculous. It's a chicken, right? We use the word chicken for someone who is cowardly, like, oh, you're being a real chicken right now. 
But in Eastern cultures, the chicken and the rooster often actually represent bravery and courage. And in that sense, the bantam really works as a logistics vessel. And much like the kestrel, in the history of the Kaldari state, the bantam used to be a troop transport before eventually being repurposed into a logistics vessel with bonuses to remote shield boosters. In the middle, we have the condor. Now, condor, again, it's a bird of prey. Very fast-moving uh, bird, which makes sense for an interceptor-style frigate. Interestingly enough as well, just for a bit of lore background here, we like to look at this ship and think that the cockpit is right at the front of the vessel. It's really not. It's actually the hump at the back, which is where the pilot would normally sit. And in a capsuleer version, that's where the capsule is injected into the ship, not the front bit. The bit that looks like a cockpit is actually the sensor array for the Condor itself. Finally, for the Tech 1 frigates, we then have a Griffin. Now, this is the first one that actually breaks the rule of, essentially, bird names. A griffin, of course, is a mythological creature that is essentially half lion, half eagle. It's usually the front legs, the wings, and the head of a bird, of, of a prey, usually something like a bald eagle, combined then with the rear legs, the back, and the tail of a lion. This does give the griffin a somewhat more imposing presence, which definitely is an ECM frigate. I can understand the naming convention they've gone for here. It's quite a fearsome creature in, uh, in mythology. It's not one of the biggest or scariest mythological creatures out there, um, but certainly it does have a certain amount of threat to it, which I feel works for a frigate that's using ECM. Going up the branch, of course, we have both the Heron Navy issue and the Griffin Navy issue. We're not going to spot, you know, stop on the Navy issue versions of ships because the names are essentially the same, just with Navy issue added. They are the Caldari State Navy equivalents. A little bit more combat oriented, for example, the Griffin Navy issue. It's less about the ECM and adds in small hybrid turret damage, whereas for the Heron uh, Navy issue, it, again, it still has the scan probe, relic and data analyzer strengths, but it also adds the ability for light missile and rocket damage there as well. The one we will talk about is the Kaldari Navy Hookbill. Now again, this may be one of those ships that does sound pretty obvious. After all, a Hookbill with the word bill in it is clearly a type of bird, but it's essentially a type of duck, which I don't know. There's a part of me that feels that this is a little bit of an unusual one. I almost expected this to be something like a hornbill. Um, an African hornbill, like Zazu in The Lion King, these are birds that are insectivorous and are known for being able to essentially poke holes in trees. Um, so they are capable of essentially dealing damage, which makes a bit more sense than a hookbill, which is more a breed of domestic duck. To me, that's the first name we've really seen in the Kaldari state that doesn't quite fit the theme for me. Hookbill almost, I feel, should have been the name, perhaps for one of the like the, the, the higher level explorer, like a Hookbill being the, uh, the buzzard, and then the buzzard being the Kaldari Navy buzzard. I think that kind of works better. We'll talk about that more when we reach that point, of course. Under the interceptors, then, we have the crow and we have the raptor. Now, the word raptor is essentially the word we use for bird of prey. So things like eagles, hawks, kestrels, gymnogenes, harriers, this kind of thing. That is what a raptor is. It's a bird of prey. Um, so this is a very generic term for a fast moving, aggressive creature of flight, which does make a certain amount of sense. It just feels a little bit generic for my personal tastes. The crow, on the other hand, I am a mad fan of the corvid family of birds, which are things like your crows, your rooks, your ravens, and, well, spoiler alert, we get quite a few of those names coming through the Kaldari state here. Crows are incredibly intelligent birds, um, which again does kind of make sense with an interceptor. These are... I, I don't know, I think that you probably could have gone for something a little more aggressive here, but a crow is still a great name for a ship like this. They're small, they are very intelligent creatures, and therefore the ability for it to be a propulsion jamming um, and sort of uh, your interceptor platform does kind of make sense. As we come up to the assault frigates, we have the hawk. Now, I mentioned earlier, <clears throat> excuse me, I mentioned earlier when we were looking at the Merlin that the Merlin is essentially a type of hawk, and therefore the hawk being simply called a hawk does make a lot of sense. It's an aggressive flying machine of death. 
I love the Hawk. It's what you've just seen at the beginning of this video. It's one of my favorite assault frigates. I love fitting this with rockets and just that cloud of rockets that launches out of it. So naming this after something that is fairly beautiful, yet aggressive at the same time, really fits for me. The other one though, is the Harpy. Now a Harpy actually comes more into Greek mythology. And I think this kind of breaks the Kaldari rules. Technically, it is a bird creature in that they're usually incredibly ugly women with wings in Greek mythology, at least. But Greek mythology tends to be more of a Galente style name, whereas the mytholo mythological links in Kaldari naming of ships tends to be more along the lines of various mythological animals. Whereas the Harpy isn't really an animal, in fact, Wikipedia describes it more as a rapacious monster described as having a woman's head and body and a bird's wings and claws, or depicted as a bird of prey with a woman's face. It's a very ugly, aggressive creature. And to me, it feels more Greek mythology than sort of mythological creature, because it's not a straight up creature like, for example, the griffin was earlier. As such, does it really fit? It kind of does, it's mythological and it's bird related, so it does tick those boxes, but I don't know, I don't know. Again, we've kind of hit one here that I feel doesn't overly fit the naming conventions present. Coming up to the covert ops ships, we have the buzzard. Now buzzard, again, is a bird of prey. And as I mentioned earlier, comparing buzzard alongside a hornbill, to me, I kind of wish that the Hornbill was the Explorer Tech 2 and the Buzzard was the Kaldari Navy frigate in the middle. Because a common Buzzard, it's a medium to large bird of prey, which has an incredibly large range, which I suppose does, you know, represent the exploration nature of the vessel. Um, it mainly lives in Europe. It's extended across mu much of sort of Eurasia, goes as far east as China. It's into Siberia, Mongolia. It's got an incredible range. So I guess that does make sense for an explorer, sort of, but you can also go for something like a swallow here, something a little bit less aggressive in its name. A buzzard's not really a hunting vessel, and buzzards were used, again, for a lot of, like, hunting things. I don't know. Maybe that's just my opinion. Let me know your thoughts and opinions in the comments down below on that one. Um, but I think the buzzard probably is a bit too much of an aggressive name for a non-combat vessel. Could just be me. Then we have the Manticore. Oh boy, this harkens right the way back to the Griffin. We are going full on mythology here with the Manticore. Um, obviously, a Manticore is a mythological creature. We have multiple uh, like parts of different animals in here. It's usually the head of a man, the body of a lion, and the tail of either a dragon or a scorpion. Scorpion tends to be the one that's most commonly used, but they do sometimes, when it says a dragon tail, it's like either a reptile tail or in certain different intellectual properties, Manticore actually has a tail with a dragon on the end, which can be really cool, like, you know, fire-breathing head on it. The most common depiction, though, is sort of almost like a lion with bat wings and a scorpion tail. Doesn't always even have a human head in a lot of their depictions of it. Now, this to me does kind of work for the Manticore, um, because the Manticore itself is... It's one of those creatures that's got a lot of history and that behind it. A lot of different folklore and culture mention it. It's originally Persian, I believe, in where it comes from. Um, it's not particularly sneaky, according to most of the sources and that you can read about it. So, I don't know. There's a part of me that thinks something like a jackalope might have fit this a bit more, but Manticore does certainly embody the aggression and the firepower that this stealth bomber can put out into the game. Going up to the electronic attack ship, we have the Kitsune. Now, Kitsune is a Japanese mythology, which again works quite nicely with the Kaldari states sort of leaning into more uh, sort of oriental design with the different aspects of the Kaldari state being very sort of often Japanese in nature. Now, the Kitsune is, of course, in Japanese folklore, a fox that possesses paranormal abilities. Um, these can often have nine tails in certain ways. They're often uh, shifting into a human form in order to trick humans. So you get like this beautiful woman who tricks a human and then turns into a fox when he's not looking. Um, they're often portrayed as faithful guardians, friends, and lovers. 
This to me actually makes me think of an electronics warf- uh, sorry, not less of an electronics warfare frigate and more of a, uh, what's it called? More of like a logistics frigate. Because yes, it's a trickster, which definitely makes sense in the terms of ECM, but they're usually more playful, less aggressive, and more along the lines I don't know. I don't know. There's a part of me that thinks that the uh, the the Ewol frigate should have been named something else, and the Kitsune should uh, the Kitsune should sorry to use the proper stressing on the word there. Kitsune should be more the logistics vessel. But again, that that's kind of up to me. It's, it's my opinion, is what I'm saying. This does mean that when we reach the logistic frigates, we have the Kirin. Now, the Kirin is an interesting creature. Now, the name Kirin itself, in most mythology, well, the most references to the word Kirin, comes from the video game series Monster Hunter, where it is essentially a lightning horse. Now, that's not really where this word actually originally comes from. This comes from Kirin in Chinese mythology, which is a legendary hooved chimerical creature um, said to appear with the imminent arrival or passing of a sage or illustrious ruler. These are sometimes depicted sort of as the kind of, I don't know how to describe it. It's kind of a reptilian horse, usually a fairly horse frame. It's got hooves, but it usually has scales down the front of its face and down its back, usually a mane of long fur, um, a fairly naked tail with hair at the end, and often horns, which are like antlers, sort of those more branching horns. So it's like a scaled horse with horns. And they're very regal creatures, which I do guess makes sense for a logistics vessel. I don't know. It works. It works. I just kind of think Kitsune might have been better here, although again, Kitsune does work with the whole ECM and trickery aspect. Moving up then to the destroyers, we have the Korax. Now, Korax is basically the, la the scientific name, not Latin name, because not all scientific names use Latin. Some of them use Greek or just Latinized words, like, for example, Brachypalma smithi, which is the uh, scientific name for the Mexican red knee tarantula. The smithi comes from the fact that it was Andrew Smith who discovered it and thus put his name in there. Anyway, we're going off on a tangent here. Korax. Um, Essentially, if you're looking at the word Korax, you're looking at the scientific name for a crow. So essentially, what we're looking at there, I'm trying to find my notes on this particular one here. Um, so Korax in biology, it is the specific species name of the common raven. Sorry, not crow, raven, which is Corvus Korax. So again, we're going back into the Corvidae um, family of birds. Like the interceptor, we had the crow. Korax is the raven's uh, scientific name. Again, we've got a small ship here that is quite damaging. It's a destroyer. Korax works because it is, you know, it's, it's a corvid, but again, the fact that we're going to a raven to me feels a little bit more of a bigger ship, but I suppose the smaller ships tend to be named more bird-like as we've seen so far, whereas some of the other ships as we get bigger become other types of mythological creatures and some weird ones later, as we'll see too. Corax, it works. I can't I don't dislike it. I think there may have been something you could probably get here that's more fitting, but it works. We then have the cormorant. Now, cormorants are actually one of my favorite birds. When I was living in Zimbabwe, I used to love watching the cormorants on the River Zambezi. These are kind of... <laughs> They're really, they, we used to call them, some of the like local communities out there call them snake neck birds as well. They have very long windy necks that they can actually move independently. Um, they will sit on branches in the river, watching for fish down below, dive into the water, grab that fish, eat it whole, and then sit there with on that branch with their wings spread out, enjoying the sun to dry off and prepare for another dive. They're beautiful birds, and we do get them here on the East Kent coastline in England as well. Um, so I sometimes am lucky enough not just to see seagulls at the beach, but to see cormorants out at sea as well. Beautiful birds, I love them to pieces, and it's a beautiful little aside. One of their other common names is the shag. Oh yeah! So I like to sit and watch a shag by the side of the river. Doesn't sound horrid at all. And of course we have the cormorant navy issue, nothing there to write home about. Coming up to the interdictor, we have the flycatcher. Now, this... 
as far as name goes, I guess it works. It's an interdictor. We've got catcher in the name, right? Flycatchers are tiny little birds, very fast moving, very nimble. They dart in and out. To me, that's almost an interceptor more than it is an interdictor. But I guess that because we've got catcher in the name, it does kind of work. I don't know. I kind of wish this had been called something more like the cuckoo. I think Cuckoo just really works for an interdictor, whereas Flycatcher, it's more of a fast-moving bird. But again, the name does work. It's a catcher, right? We're talking about catching things with interdiction spheres. Moving up then, the Command Destroyer, a Stork. Now, a Stork should be a fairly obvious name for most people. It's a big bird, commonly in mythology used to represent the, uh, the birds that bring newborn babies to their parents. As such, for a Command Destroyer as well, it kind of works because it's giving something as to those around it as well, I guess. <laughs> I don't know what to say on that one. And then finally, up at the top tier, we have the Jackdaw. Again, a Jackdaw is a type of Corvid, closely related to ravens and crows. Beautiful birds, some of my favourites. We've got a beautiful colony of them um, just up the road in Sandwich. I love walking along the river there. There's this big group of, uh, of jackdaws that like to sit on the riverside there um, and try and steal chips or bits of sandwiches and that from passers-by. They do eat uh, various insects and they will go for the fish in the river as well. They're fantastically playful birds and I think that works really quite nicely for a Tech 3 ship, um, especially one that's got the multiple modes to it like the tactical destroyers do because it's quite playful. Now, moving into the cruisers, things start to get a little bit weird here. First of all, with the Tech 1 cruiser, the Caracal. Now, Caracal is actually a medium-sized wildcat native to Africa. They've got these beautiful sort of orangey coats with black and white ears and these beautiful markings down the side of their nose. This is where we actually move away from the concept of birds and mythological creatures, and we come into smaller sort of omnivores, if that makes sense. It doesn't quite fit the Minmatar thing of predators like the hyena, the cheetah, and so on. Um, but it's there. It's on that same sort of footing in my head. Then, of course, we have the MOA. Now, uh, when I asked a lot of people in my community what they thought the MOA was, it was one of those things that people would say, oh, that's a type of snake, isn't it? No, that's a boa. The MOA is a flightless uh, group of birds, uh, a group of flightless birds that were originally endemic to New Zealand, but they are now extinct, which is why a lot of people wouldn't necessarily know what they are. They are kind of like small-ish ostriches, and that's a naming convention we will see come up. There's not really, again, much to say here. Now, the Osprey. Ospreys are awesome. Ospreys are, again, birds of prey. Um, they are endemic. We see them here in the UK quite a bit. We see them, uh, they've got a good wide range, often known as a seahawk or a river hawk, sometimes a fish hawk. Um, they're fish eating birds of prey. Um, they do often actually, you, you see them all over the UK basically. Um, interesting side, side note there, my primary school, we had our different houses, you know, you've got your little, little house points and that. I was in Ospreys. I was actually house captain of Ospreys at one point. Finally, then, for the tech ones, we have Blackbird. Really not much to say. These are a common garden bird across most of Europe and North America. Um, I was When I was a church-going youth, I actually had a woman come up to me one Sunday and say to me, Oh, Ben, you know a fair bit about animals and birds. I wonder if you could help identify this little bird I keep seeing in my garden. And I said, Sure, what does it look like? She said, Oh, it's a, it's a little blackbird with a yellow beak. I said, That's a blackbird. And she said, Yeah, it's a blackbird with a yellow beak. And I said, No, it's called a blackbird. And she didn't believe me, so she came back next week with a photo of it, and I said, yes, that's a blackbird. It's called a blackbird. My granddad used to have a very friendly one that used to sit on his shovel while he was doing the gardening just so we could get to the worms. We'll skip over the Navy issue cruisers, because again, they don't mean much, and come in to our, uh, our recons. Now, a rook. A rook, again, is a corvid. It's also the name of a chess piece, as you know. It's the tower in chess, the ones you have on the very end of your board. But they are corvids, like crows, like ravens, like jackdaws, like magpies. Um, again, very long uh, range here. You get them as far north as Scandinavia, as far east as Siberia, and as far west um, across into uh, Europe. I don't know if you get these in America, actually. I should probably check that. Uh, if you get rooks in America, but they're certainly European birds and um, with a good range that goes all the way east into sort of China and as far west as the UK. 
very intelligent birds, which kind of makes sense for an ECM type ship. Falcon, again, shouldn't really need much explaining. A falcon is a hunting bird. They are birds of prey, they're raptors, very readily trainable as well. So often you get falconry displays where they've trained their birds to go off and hunt something and bring it back or to land on members of the audience for treats and things like that. Um, again, this feels like a bit more of an aggressive name than this perhaps could be. I would have probably more thought that the... the, the the Rook and the Falcon, I think they're backwards. I kind of think that the Rook should be your uh, medium hybrid, whereas the Falcon should be the one that can't be detected by directional scanners because it's the Hunter, right? I don't know. Again, maybe that's just me. Can we go to the heavy assault cruisers, Cerberus. Cerberus, of course, is Hades dog guardian of the underworld, big three-headed dog in Greek mythology. Again, it's Greek mythology, which is technically more the grounds of the Galente, but I kind of think this one does get away with it because it's a mythological beast, whereas the harpy is, they do talk, harpies talk, so they're less beasts and they're more just mythology, whereas the Cerberus, 100%, it is a beast. And Hercules, one of his 12 arduous tasks is to tame Cerberus, which goes swimmingly for him. And then, of course, we have the Eagle. You don't get a much more b obvious bird name than the Eagle. Um, it doesn't specify what type of Eagle we're looking at here. Is it a fish Eagle? Is it a bald Eagle? Is it a golden Eagle? There's so many different types of Eagle. I guess you don't need to specify. We don't, we're not running out of bird names anytime soon. Um, again, it works. It's an aggressive ship. It's not the best heavy attack cruiser, heavy assault cruiser, but it, it is what it is. And it's an eagle. It's a raptor. It's a bird of prey. It works. Then we come up to the Onyx. Now, this this one is one I've really struggled to do some research on because trying to find out what an Onyx actually is took me a, a long, long time. Obviously, Onyx is a Pokemon. It's the big snake like one that is rock. Um, and the word onyx, onyx is a type of rock, which makes sense. There's no animal I could find called an onyx. What I could find is an oryx, O-R-Y-X, which is a powerfully built and deep chested, uh, like oxen kind of thing. It, it, not oxen, sorry, gazelle, that's the word I'm looking for. Long, straight horns, beautiful sort of brownish gray coats with black and white markings on the face. Um, essentially, it, it, yeah, it's a type of antelope, which does work with some of the other names, like we've had Caracal and things like that. It's like, in Zimbabwe, we used to get Gemsbok, and Gemsbok are a type of oryx. It's a genus consisting of four large antelope species. I can't remember all of them off the top of my head, but I know that the Gemsbok is one of them, and there are a few others as well. Do I have my notes here? Uh, the gems box. No, that's the only one I've noted down in my notes. I really should do a little bit more research on that. But I don't think that's supposed to be Onyx. I think that's supposed to be Oryx. And I don't know. That doesn't really make sense to me as a heavy interdiction cruiser name either way because they're not exactly predatory. They don't grab and hold on to things. I suppose an Oryx works in the sense of this ship being used for threading wormholes, but that's kind of the only way I can get it to fit. I don't know. Let me know your thoughts. I might be missing something there. Then we come up to the Basilisk. Now this to me is absolutely backwards. This should not be the name that it has. A logistics cruiser called a Basilisk. A Basilisk being a reptilian creature from mythology that is renowned for being able to turn people to stone with its gaze. Usually it has six or eight legs as well, originally described by Pliny the Elder in Naturali Naturalis Historia. The Basilisk of Cyrene. It's a small snake being not more than 12 inches in length that is so venomous it leads to a wide trail of deadly venom in its wake, and its gaze is likewise lethal, is how it's quoted. Um, according to Pliny, the Basilisk's weakness is the odour of a weasel. But uh, when I, I don't get this. It's a logistics thing. A, a ridiculously aggressive and dangerous mythological creature that's all about venom and a, an ability to turn you to stone with its gaze doesn't fit. Really doesn't fit. To me, Basilisk should have been the Interdictor. And then the Interdictor may be, be uh, sorry, the Logistics Cruiser being something like an Oryx because at least it's a herd animal and it flies in fleets. Uh, I don't know. 
Then we come to the Tengu, last of the cruisers here, and I love the name of this. Tengu, to me, is probably one of the best names here because we get to reference the kind of Eastern ideology and themes going on in the Kaldari state. We get to use the mythological creature part of the naming convention, and we also get to reference birds. Of course, for those of you who know, Tengu comes from Japanese mythology where they are half bird, half, cre uh, half man creatures found in Shinto. They are uh, it, the literal translation of Tengu is heavenly dog, which is a bit of an interesting one. And they're a type of yokai, spiritual beings, um, or Shinto kami, gods or spirits. So basically, they take the forms of birds of prey, occasionally monkeys, so you sometimes get the ones with the really long red nose, but they usually have bird-like wings, um, so they have those kind of mix of human, monkey, and avian characteristics. Um, if you've watched like 42 Ronin, is it 42 Ronin? No, it's not. It's the one with Keanu Reeves. Uh, he actually was raised by the Tengu, and they've got a really cool uh, depiction of them in there. Uh, in Buddhism, they were long held that Tengu were disruptive demons and harbingers of war, which I really think works for the Tech 3 strategic cruiser, right? I think that's brilliant. I think that is one of the most cleverly named ships in EVE. Let's move on to the battle cruisers because this is where things begin to come undone a little bit. Starting with a Ferox. Now, again, like the Onyx, the Ferox is one that I struggled trying to find an actual kind of link here because it's not something that we have directly. Instead, what we get here is Fossa, a Fossa, which is, where does this come from? The scientific name is Cryptoproctor ferox. It's a slender, long-tailed cat-like mammal endemic to Madagascar. So it's kind of like a weasel cat thing that's only found in Madagascar. Its name is traditionally Fossa, not Ferox, but that's where Ferox comes from. I don't know, this one feels really weird. I don't <laughs> it's like a weasel cat, and that's what they named their battle cruiser after. Of all the mythological creatures or sort of small omnivores we could have gone for, it feels a weird one, but it did teach me what a fossa was, and they're kind of cute, so thank you, Eve, for that. Drake. Drake is, again, a wonderful mix, which makes sense for a ship this popular, right? So there are a couple of different references here. Obviously, Drake in mytholog uh, mythological terms is like a small dragon-like creature, usually referencing a dragon that only has four limbs, i.e. two legs, the tail and then wings with the clawed hands on the wings rather than most dragons are, bit, are six limbed creatures because they've got four legs and then the wings. Drakes tend to be the two wings and then just the legs with the long serpentine head. Obviously Drake is also the term for a male duck which hooks into our like bird related theming here. Finally, of course, Aubrey Drake Graham is the Canadian rapper and singer best known for his yeah and nah meme. You know the one I'm talking about. Moving on, we then have the Naga. Now, a Naga, again, is a mythological name. So in this case, we are talking about a, I think they're Indian, if I remember, Sanskrit? Let me check my notes. Yeah, there we are. Half human, half serpent beings that reside in the netherworld of Patala can occasionally take human or part human form. Female Naga is called a Nagi or a Nagini. Um, and according to legend, they're the children of the sage Kashiapa and Kajru. Essentially, again, these are half human, half snake creatures um, in Hindu mythology. I don't know much about Hindu mythology, so I don't feel like I can talk too much about this. And I didn't dig out that much in my notes. Um, but again, they tend to be quite warlike and aggressive from what I see. So it does hold that, yeah, this would be the name for the Kaldari ship with snake-like qualities. I don't know, do snakes really come up in Kaldari thing that much? It's a bit of a weird name, but it kind of works. I'm not going to diss it too much. I think if you're going for the big cat names and things like that, then something else might have worked here or some kind of other more aggressive bird. But it kind of works. Going above the Navy issues, of course, we come to our Tech 2s, where we have the Nighthawk. Now, Nighthawk, obviously, it's got hawk in the name. That means it's a bird, right? Yes, but it's not at all what you might think it is. You think of a Nighthawk and you think of this gigantic, big, nasty creature that's like a nocturnal version of an eagle or a falcon. No, 
It's actually a type of nightjar. They're very small little birds that are primarily insectivorous. And of course, we've got the shut cluster shutdown happening right in the middle of me recording a video. So we'll finish off the uh, battle cruisers. And I'll come back after the break. So yeah, the Nighthawk is actually this really cute little insectivorous bird that is found mainly across Europe, um, occasionally used in the Americas as well, so you do find it across that way. It's got a very wide range of it. Um, yeah, they're just insectivorous little things that look almost like a swallow, and they've got that kind of forked tail aspect to them as well. Not really what I would expect for a command ship, especially a battlecruiser with that much firepower kind of feels like that should have been something a little bit more aggressive in its name. Finally then, we have the Vulture for battle cruisers, and not much really to say here. You should be aware of what a Vulture is. It's a bird of prey that scavenges on carrion, very common across Africa, Europe, Asia. There are some in North and South America as well. Um, they can be very ugly looking birds. Very, a lot of people think they are just uh, just scavengers, they're really, really not. They are actually capable of hunting as well, just not as often. They tend to just jump onto carrion, like lion will have a kill, then the vultures will swoop in once the lions are done or when there's an opportunity to do so. Great for cleaning up. One of the fun things about a vulture is that it actually has no gag reflex and a very unusual sense of smell, which is kind of important, I guess, when you are burying your face in creatures that may have been dead for several days. I get it. This one kind of works. This a vulture kind of feels like perhaps what the naga should have been called because of that sort of, I don't know, maybe? I don't know. I don't know. It works. It's a, it, it's a big bird. It's a big bird, so it does kind of work. Okay, so let's now take a look at the battleships. First of all, the Roke, or the Rock. There's actually no good pronunciation guide on this one. It does depend very much where you're from. It originally comes from the Arabian Nights mythology of Southeastern Europe, so sort of your Middle East, um, where the Rock is this gigantic bird that essentially blots out the sun in the adventures of Sinbad. Now, where I say that this comes from multiple different pronunciations, rock or roke both work, is because where that starts in the Middle East, it then differentiates out with the telling of those legends of Sinbad, and as it enters Europe and as it enters sort of Asia, it gets different pronunciations en route. When you go back to the original, even then, there's no solid way of knowing whether it was originally roke or rock, uh, because it's just spelled R-O-C in sort of a romantic uh, language dialect, whereas in obviously its original telling it would have been written in Arabic, so there's no good way of seeing. Moving on, we have the Raven. Raven, of course, we're going back to our Corvids, our Jackdaws, our Crows, our Coraxes. Yeah, our Ravens. It's a raven. It's that gigantic black bird, right? One of the most intelligent creatures on our planet, capable of making tools. It can imitate more sounds than your average parrot can. I love ravens. And of course, we have ravens right here in England, in London, in the Tower of London. There is a flock of ravens there that have a guy whose sole job as raven master of the Tower of London is to look after them. And it is said in British mythology that should the ravens ever leave the Tower of London, then the kingdom of Great Britain shall surely fall. So far, they're there. They haven't left yet. It feels like they should probably be packing their bags right now sometimes, though, if you're watching the news. Maybe that's just me being all doom and gloom, but I love ravens. Ravens are probably one of my favorite animals. If I had to pick a spirit animal, it would probably be a fox, a raven, or a wolf. So, again, probably why I like Kaldari names and why I like Minmatar names, right? You can kind of see a theme running there. Raven, big battleship, lots of firepower, and considering how big ravens actually are, it's one of those things, I think once you've seen a crow, you assume a raven is just a little bit bigger. No, these things can be huge. They can have a very, very large wingspan. Um, yeah, incredibly intelligent birds. I love them to pieces. Great name for a battleship for the Kaldari. We then have the Scorpion. <sighs> oh, the Scorpion. This ship is one of those absolute love it and hate it's for me. On one hand, it's kind of obvious why it's called a Scorpion, right? It's Scorpion shaped. 
but uh, uh, this feels like one of those that we just kind of designed a cool ship, said it looks like a scorpion, so we called it a scorpion. But do they have scorpions in Kaldari space? Like everything else, when you go into the info here, it talks about how they are named after these things from ancient mythology, these unusual birds from and creatures from times long gone. So... Were scorpions that ubiquitous? Yeah, I guess, you know, they appear in a lot of literature. They appear in a lot of sort of, you know, there's a lot of information about scorpions. So seeing a ship that looks like this, I just don't get why you des design a ship specifically that looks this way. I guess we need to ask the rabbit that. Um, oh, Gurustaf's Law, slide that in there, Benzie. The scorpion, I'm not a huge fan of how it looks and the name feels a little bit on the nose. It does kind of make sense that a creature that uses venom and gigantic pincers to hold its prey, ECM, kind of works. I just feel like it was named because someone designed a cool ship like this. this is, someone came in with some really cool artwork and went, hey guys, look at this ship, what shall we call it? And they just went, well, it looks like a scorpion. I don't know, it feels a little bit low tier for me. Uh, I know that's going to anger some people, but it does go up to the Widow. Now, the Widow, again, interesting name here because it's not mythological, it's not a bird, and it's not even the small animals like we see with the Ferox and the Caracal. No, the Widow, obviously, is referencing, like, a Black Widow spider. So we've suddenly got an arthropodic name, Arachnid, from, you know, direct here. Which kind of works with scorpions. Scorpions are arachnids. Widows, spiders are arachnids. Eh? And yeah, for a deadly neurotoxic creature, ECM works. I can't fault it. I don't particularly like it. It feels a little bit standout, but it works. Then finally, we come up to the golem. And again, this is a really unusual name. I don't know if I like the name of the Golem. I love the Golem as a ship. You know, I it was the first Marauder I ever flew. And in the EVE Online board game, the, having the Golem in there... Oh, God, it's it's terrifying when someone plays a Golem onto the battlefield. Like, I don't mind it when they play a Paladin or a Kronos, but the Golem? Oh, it makes me weep. It's a great ship, but a Golem? A Golem is a mythological creature that is essentially man-made material brought to life. Stone Golem, Clay Golem, this kind of thing. Usually, I think it's in Yiddish culture, where you write like a spell on a piece of parchment that is then put inside the creature and brings it to life. Which means it's not really a mythological animal either, which doesn't fit in with the mythology uh, myth mythology side of things. Mythology? Bleh. It doesn't fit in with the mythological side of the Kaldari naming conventions. It doesn't fit Eastern traditions like the Tengu um, and the Kitsune and the Kirin. It's, it's, not an, it's not a bird. It's just so standout. I don't know. The battleships are such weird ground here for the Kaldari. But you've got the Golem, the Widow, and the Scorpion. They just don't fit the other kind of naming conventions of the Kaldari state. What could you have here? I don't know. Maybe going for something like the Aquila, because that's going into the whole, like, eagles and gigantic birds and things like that. I don't know. Uh, some kind of dragon name. Like, perhaps there's some dragon from... Eastern mythology that you could fit in there that would work with Eastern mythology and the kind of winged drake and that kind of stuff. Yeah, Shenlong. Let's call it Shenlong. That, that'll do. That'll do. Then we come to the capitals. Now, Phoenix is obviously a bit of an obvious one as well. This is one of those I don't think it needs much explaining. The Phoenix comes from, I think it's East, again, it's Southeast, East, there. I'll get the word in my head in a moment. Um, sort of your Middle Eastern. Is that where the phoenix comes from? It's the bird that when it dies, it's reborn in fire. It's an immortal thing. Um, this immortal bird that is reborn in flames and thus cannot truly die. Different cultures and different aspects, it pops up all over the place. Like sometimes the bird just bursts into flame and leaves an egg behind. Sometimes when the creature goes to die, it flies into a fire, which means theoretically, if you could stop it getting to the fire, it wouldn't be reborn. It, it, there's all kinds of different versions of it. And as I'm looking at my notes here, Egyptian and Persian, um, it comes along in, but it's originally from Greek mythology. I thought it was actually a, a sort of Middle Eastern originally, but hey, Again, we all learn something. So the Phoenix, Greek mythology, bird of fire, rebirth. Bird of fire, bird, fire, mythology, dreadnought. Yeah, 
it works. Coming up to the Lancer, we then have the Karura. Now this is obviously a new ship to EVE Online. It's therefore a bit of a, a, a new one to the game. A lot of people wondering where that name comes from. Well, again, it's Japanese mythology, just like the Tengu. It's a divine creature with a human torso and a bird-like head. It's a literal, it's a transliteration of Garuda, a race of enormous gigantic birds in Hinduism. So we've kind of got two different bits being referenced here. And of course this works, that Hindu link works with the Naga, but it's then taken the Japanese name, which works with the Kaldari references in their culture. Plus it has bird-like aspects, which really works. Actually of the four new uh, Lancer Dreadnoughts, the Karura is the one I think works really quite nicely as a name. It's, like, it's not to say the other ones are bad names, like Bane works really well, Valraven, who doesn't love Valraven? Um, but this one just has a lovely little layer of subtext to it, and it kind of cross-references across the place. So it twins nicely with both the Tengu and with the Naga in terms of its naming history. It's still a bird-like creature. It, it just ticks a lot of boxes, and I think that really, really works. Obviously, Garuda as well, if you play Final Fantasy, is a gigant. It's one of the Eidolons, um, the bird Eidolon, especially in Final Fantasy XIV, uh, which makes sense. It's basically a demigod, so it's the Dreadnought, right? And it's a bird. Then we come up to the carriers. Now we have the Minakawa. Now, Minakawa is a giant dragon-like bird in Philippine mythology. Now, this was believed to be so large that it could swallow, or at least cover, depending on your translation, the sun, and it was used to explain the occurrence of eclipses. Now, it's even described as a giant bird named Minakawa that lives in outer space, which can devour the sun and the moon and would try to do the same with Earth. It's a Bogobo tale from the Philippines, and again, that kind of feels a little bit aggressive for what is essentially your force auxiliary. This is a capital-sized uh, logistics vessel, and the Minakara is a creature that can devour the sun. To me, that almost works better as the Dreadnought. Like, Minakawa perhaps should have been the Dreadnought, and Phoenix should have been the Force Auxiliary, because Phoenixes are about rebirth, and therefore capacitor transmitter, remote shield boosters, that kind of works with the Phoenix ideology, perhaps, maybe, maybe I'm going crazy. That's that's my way of looking at it. Chimera, this again is Greek mythology, I recall. Greek mythology for the Chimera. It is a three-headed creature, um, fire-breathing female monster, there, resembling a lion in the forepart, a goat in the middle, and a dragon behind. Sometimes it's three heads, sometimes it's two heads at the front with a dragon on the tail. There's all kinds of different ways that this is kind of described. Um, even the way we say Chimera nowadays, again, this is why I say a lot of these mythological names, you can pronounce them multiple different ways. It doesn't, doesn't fit with Old Greek. In Greek, it would have originally been Chimera um, or Chimera, which literally translates as she-goat. Yeah, it's from Lycia in Asia Minor, composed of different animal parts, usually depicted as a lion with the head of a goat protruding from its back and a tail that might end in a snake's head. It was the offspring of Typhon and Echidna and a sibling of monsters like Cerberus and the Lernaean Hydra. Big part of Greek mythology, you've probably seen the Chimera um, a whole lot, and it does make sense that, again, to have a capital ship named after something quite so large and aggressive. Is there a better name that fits a carrier more? Perhaps, but I think Chimera works. Then in the middle, we have the Wyvern, or Wyvern, again, depending on your pronunciation. Now, Wyvern, or Wyvern, again, it's kind of going down the old draconic route here. Now, it's a mythological animal, usually represented as a two-legged winged version of a dragon. So again, a dragon tends to have four legs with two wings, where a wyvern, wyvern tends to have two wings and two legs, kind of like a drake is often uh, depicted. Often as well with the tail of a viper, like a venomous snake, the fact that that's re uh, reflected in the etymology of wyvern, which comes from the, ultimately from the Latin word vipera, which of course means viper, right? being the source of the word Viper. Um, however, the creature the woven most closely resembles is the also mythical dragon. Dragon is actually a much older word and has been in use since the 13th century, whilst Wyvern dates only to the early 17th. But Wyvern also comes 
with it the, the history of the word worm, um, which we use quite a lot in British culture and Celtic culture to represent sort of more draconic things like the worm of Grimsby and that kind of thing. Lots of cool stuff going on there with wyverns. And again, makes sense for a carrier, big future drag, well, big dragony, draconic mythological creature winged. It works. Finally, then for the Titan, we have Leviathan. Oh, yes. Now, again, Leviathan these days, it's kind of mutated in how it gets used. I think a lot of people, when we think of Leviathan, we think, thanks to Final Fantasy and the prominence of like Japanese RPGs, of Leviathan as being this water snake, this gigantic water dragon snake thing that occasionally can fly, spit spouts of water, all kinds of big, crazy stuff like that. However, that's not where it originally comes from. Leviathan directly is from the Bible, it's biblical, and it's where I think we, is, am I confusing myself that we get this from the, no, I'm thinking Jonah and the whale. I'm thinking Jonah and the whale. No, it's Babylonian. I've got my notes here, so I, I, I keep putting my, my phone down and putting my notes to one side thinking, yeah, I can just keep talking about this, and then I forget something. Now, the Leviathan in the Old Testament appears in Psalms 74 to 14 as a multi-headed sea serpent killed by God and given as food to the Hebrews in the wilderness. In Isaiah 27, 1, Leviathan is a serpent and a symbol of Israel's enemies who will be slain by God. It does appear numerous times later in Job 41. It's a sea monster and a symbol of God's power of creation. And it's sometimes used later on to talk about, like in Revelation, some translations have the Leviathan as almost being a proxy for the devil. Lots of different words there, but essentially it is a sea serpent um, from the Bible, um, less so from sort of your, your Japanese role-playing games. Anyway, let's move down now from the capitals into the bottom line. Obviously, we don't need to talk about Kaldari Shuttle. There's no interesting name there. Then we come along to the uh, to, to, to the haulers, the industrial vessels. And this is where things get really interesting for me. I genuinely find these fascinating that these are the names they went with. Now, a badger. A badger is obviously a creature we very commonly see here in the UK. Usually it's roadkill, sadly. Black and white creature. Um, fairly large, actually, the size of a you know decent sized medium dog. Um, they tunnel. They're terrifying looking creatures. Big, strong jaws. Amazingly long claws that are used to dig. Tend to be fairly sedentary and you know secluded. They tend to run away from things, but you never corner a badger. They're terrifying. So why is it an industrial hauler? I don't know. It kind of works with the omnivore theme we've seen with like caracal and stuff like that. But it's an unusual name for sure. And the tyra. This was one I didn't know until I was researching for this video. Now, the Tyra is an omnivorous animal from the weasel family native to the Americas. It's the only species in the genus Ira. It's a weasel. It's a weasel. Why is there a, an industrial hauler named after a weasel? I don't know. But again, it fits with like the ferox, the fossa. It kind of works alongside the badger. It's just a naming convention, I guess. It doesn't seem particularly referential, but it's there. Going up, a crane. Again, we're talking about a large bird. Um, cranes, obviously used in construction as well, but that's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about like the, the things that lift things over a building site. We're talking about the cranes. Large bird, looks a little bit like a stork. Long legs and long necks. Um, they're gruiforms, if I remember rightly. Um, again, they tend to be water birds. Um, walk along the, uh, the river, tend to eat eat fish and other insects from below the water. Beautiful crowned feathers on the top of their heads. Like one of the, uh, uh, one of the pictures I've got here in my notes is a sandhill crane. It's like this tawny brown color with a white neck and a white face and this vibrant red cap to the top of their heads. And cranes can be really quite pretty and you do get these all over the world in different, uh, different, bre uh, different breeds, different species is the word I'm looking for. Um, according to my notes, cranes live on almost all continents, with the exception of Antarctica and South America. Sorry, South America, you don't get the awesome bird that is the crane. Finally, then, we have the bustard. Now, a bustard, again, we are talking birds, often misreferred to as a bastard because people find that funny. Um, they're large terrestrial birds living mainly in dry grassland areas and on the steps of the Old World, so like Africa and Asia. 
These are omnivorous, opportunistic eat, uh, birds that eat leaves, beads, uh, beads, buds and seeds, fruit, small vertebrates, invertebrates, and there are 26 species currently identified. So think basically turkey-like birds um, that just roam a lot of Africa, Asia, and Europe, and you're not far off there. Again, why is it a hauler? I don't know, but it is. I'm also mastery five in them, despite the fact that I can't fly them. Finally, then we have our two freighters, the first of which is the Charon. This really struck me as unusual, because my first thought when I think of Charon is Greek mythology, again, which feels Galente, the son of Erebus and Nyx, whose duty it was to ferry uh, over the river Styx and Acheron, those souls of the deceased who had received the rites of burial. In payment, he received the coin that was placed in the mouth of the corpse. He's the ferryman, the ferryman of the dead. And that works for a hauler, right? Except it's Greek mythology. It's Greek mythology, which means it should really be more Galente, right? Am I going crazy here? Charon feels like it should be in the Galente tree because it's Greek mythology. Surely there could have been something else there, like, uh, I don't know. This uh, stork, to me, is less more of a, a command destroyer and more of a carrier, like, you know, a hauler, because storks are known to carry babies, right? That's, that's what storks do. But there we are, Charon. I can't find any link to Charon and animal, so I don't think there's an animal that's named a Charon. Or something like that. I mean, the closest is the Ambli Ambi uh, Amblipigid. If you've watched Harry Potter, the, I can't remember which Harry Potter it is. It, oh, it's got to be Goblet of Fire because it's Mad Eye Moody. Goblet of Fire. They're teaching the the, the, the deadly curses, um, and it's the big crab-like arachnid that they show this. Tailless Whip Scorpion. I love those creatures. They're ugly as all hell, but completely harmless to humans. Um, and they're sometimes referred to as whip spiders or tailless whip scorpions. They're what uh, Mad-Eye Moody casts those curses on in, I'm sure it's Goblet of Fire. Um, and I love them. They're brilliant little arachnids. But again, they tend to kind of hide and live in tree bark. And yeah, they're predatory. So like, why? Why would you call your, your freighter that? It's either a ferryman of the dead or a particular genus of whip scorpion. Ah. Uh. Finally, then, we have the rear. And again, this was one of those that I had no idea what this was until I actually found it out. A rear, also known as a nandu, is a South American ostrich. Yeah, basically, think an ostrich. If you make an ostrich smaller, it becomes an emu. If you make it ever so slightly smaller than an emu, it becomes a rear, which is a South American ostrich. They're really fluffy as well. They look really cute. I was actually really quite, I was like, I found this online as I'm, you know, looking up what on earth a rear is. I was like, oh, oh, but okay, if that's an ost, uh, if that's a rear, again, why are we naming this after the ferryman of the dead or a, a really secretive, timid arachnid? Maybe this should be called an ostrich or an emu. I don't know. It just feels wrong. But anyway, there we are. That's the Kaldari ship tree. This has been a very long video um, going over these names and talking about all these different birds. I could talk about birds for a long time. I didn't realize I'm such a twitcher. Like, crikey, I love birds. This is a new realization for me. My poor little autistic brain hasn't clicked that actually I'm quite fascinated by birds. But there we go. Hope you've learned something. I've learned that I can waffle on for 40 minutes about uh, Kaldari ship tree names. There we go. Thanks for watching, folks. Let me know your favorite of these names in the comment section down below. If you agree with me that some of these should probably be named different things, I'd love to hear your thoughts and opinions. If you think, like, as I said earlier, some of these could be swapped around, let me know. Anyway, folks, thanks for watching. Happy sailing and see you in New Eden.